Attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello and welcome. This is Lauren Wenzel at the National Marine Protected Areas Center, and I'm happy to welcome you all to our monthly uh, webinar on marine protected areas. Uh, we do this uh, the second Thursday of every month, and so we hope you'll join us in the future and um, check in on future topics. Today we're really pleased to welcome Sarah Hutto from the Gulf of Farallones National Marine Sanctuary Program, and she is actually returning to the series. She came last August and talked to us about the um, Sanctuary's Climate Smart Adaptation Project, and now she's coming back to give us an update and tell us about the latest. So I will introduce her in a moment. Um, but first, I just wanted to thank Open Channels and EBM Tools Network for partnering with us on this webinar series. Um, today's topic is Climate Smart Adaptation for the North Central California Coast and Ocean Habitat Species and Ecosystem Services. Um, Sarah is going to talk for uh, about 35, 40 minutes, and then we're going to have plenty of time for questions and answers. So please go ahead and use the question box on the webinar interface to type in your questions. You can do that as they occur to you through the presentation or uh, when Sarah is done with her presentation and we'll be taking those. So I really encourage you to participate. Um, and now I'm going to introduce Sarah. She is the Ocean Climate Specialist at the Gulf of the Farallones National Marine Sanctuary and the coordinator of the Sanctuary's Climate Smart Adaptation Project. Sarah has a science background in kelp ecology and has been working in marine resource management for three years, and she will be providing an update on the Climate Smart Adaptation Project, the first comprehensive and prioritized adaptation plan within the California coast and ocean-based on climate smart principles. So thank you, Sarah, and welcome. Thank you, Lauren, for the introduction. I'm very happy to be back, and thanks, everyone, for um, joining in. Um, and as Lauren mentioned, I was here in August of last year to really introduce the project to the community um, of practitioners and to also provide some kind of preliminary results from our vulnerability assessments. And so I felt like it was a good time now <coughs> to make a return appearance because we've got our final assessment results um, kind of figured out and analyzed. Um, we're about to finalize the report from that portion of the project and we are embarking on the adaptation planning portion, um, and so I have more specifics regarding how we'll be approaching that as well. So I figured it'd be a good time to come back, make a return appearance, and update everyone on how the project is going. So thank you for having me again. Um, and just a brief overview, in August I really provided um, more background information about the climate work that the sanctuary is doing, but I won't do that again this time, but I do just wanted to, I wanted to mention that our Climate Smart Conservation Program at Gulf of Farallons um, is our attempt to really integrate climate change into every aspect of sanctuary management, including mitigation, science and monitoring, communication, and what we'll be talking about today, adaptation. Um, and adaptation in the sense of how can we adapt our management of this marine protected area to respond to climate change in an effective way. And so the goal of our Climate Smart Adaptation Project for the North Central California Coast and Ocean is to protect and maintain healthy ecosystems, primarily by enhancing the resilience of our species, habitats, and ecosystem services to the impacts of climate change through collaboratively developed adaptation actions that are feasible, effective, and nature-based. It's kind of a mouthful. It always takes me a minute to get through that goal, but it's important to have a well-developed goal for a project like this. Um, and the scope of our project is quite large. It covers the boundaries of our sanctuary, Gulf of the Fairlands, as well as Cordell Bank, um, and our recently expanded areas, which I believe um, that expansion should be final today-ish, so we'll have to remove the word proposed off of this map. Um, as well as the northern portion of Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary, two national parks, and a U.S. Fish and Wildlife Refuge. So um, we have a lot of folks involved in this project. It's, it's a huge geographic scope and really a first-of-its-kind attempt to do this kind of work on this um, scale, especially in a marine and coastal environment. And so, um, speaking of all the folks involved, we've had a dynamic team of partners that are either providing expertise as part of our project planning committee, financial support, or both, and we're very thankful to the California Landscape Conservation Cooperative and National Park Service for providing funds for phase one. And the LCC has committed funds for us to um, carry out phase two, so we're very um, grateful 
grateful for that. But these are all the folks that have been involved. Um, many, many more people have been involved in our decision support workshops, but these are the folks that are um, really partnering to make this project happen. And so this adaptation project, um, kind of one of the best ways to really describe it in a nutshell is to um, show you kind of what the two, the two big questions we're, we are looking to answer. And so the first is how vulnerable to climate change are the species, habitats, and ecosystem services that we manage? And I hope that we have um, at least preliminarily answered this question through our vulnerability assessments. Um, this, of course, is, is an ongoing um, attempt to really characterize what's happening in our marine protected area. And so the, the job really is never done, but we hope that through the first phase of this project that we have at least some sort of idea of which resources are most vulnerable and why. Um, and then once we have that understanding, we hope to answer the question of, well, then what can we do to limit or reduce that vulnerability? And that's through the second phase of our project or our adaptation planning phase. And so to kind of show you that graphically um, with this figure, this is a very simple representation of um, the adaptation planning process. And so that first phase, which I really consider our information gathering phase, um, consists of first you need to identify what, what you're going to focus on. We knew we couldn't uh, do vulnerability assessments for every species in this huge region. Um, not even every habitat or, e or every ecosystem service. And so we needed to identify um, our, what we're terming, focal resources. In this figure, it's termed conservation targets. Um, but same thing, what, what are we focusing on? And then once we, we know that, we can then assess the vulnerability to climate change for those resources by looking more closely at these three components of vulnerability, sensitivity, exposure, and adaptive capacity, which um, I'll talk about in more detail here in a moment. And so um, this is kind of where we are now. We've, we've wrapped up phase one. We have an idea of how vulnerable our resources are. And um, I'm definitely excited to show you um, kind of our general results from that. But now we need to get into what I think is the even more fun part of the project. Now that we have this understanding, what can we, den what can we then do about it um, to hopefully reduce vulnerability of some of those um, resources? And so we want to identify um, effective management options and then implement those management options in phase two. <clears throat> and so um, I, I won't go in, in great detail through phase one like I did uh, back in August because I do want to focus this presentation more on, on moving forward and the results, but I did want to mention that um, we decided to accomplish this first phase, the vulnerability assessment phase, by really bringing in as many experts as we could. We knew we didn't want to limit this just internally to the sanctuary because um, the boundaries of the project are so vast. And also, we don't necessarily have the in-house expertise um, to figure all of this out. So we held two decision support workshops um, to help us gather this necessary information for adaptation planning. And so the first was in February of last year, and this was to help define our focal resources, that kind of first step in that adaptation planning cycle that you saw. Um, and so we brought together, I think, around 35 um, managers, scientists, um, local academics, and uh, NGO representatives to recommend to us which species, habitats, and ecosystem services they felt we should be focusing on for this project. Um, and then in June, <coughs> excuse me, in June of last year, we brought together um, many of the same people, but some additional um, needed expertise to actually assess the vulnerability of those resources. And so this is a two-day workshop, and this was really, um, this was really the, the hard work of the first phase, was to actually sit down with a few other folks and work through very specific questions about these resources so that we could get a sense um, of how vulnerable they, they may be to, to climate change. And so I'll, I'll walk through that process a little more um, here in a moment. But this is really how we accomplished the first phase. And so to give you a sense, um, what, what is vulnerability and um, why is it important to understand and, and how do we break it down into its different components? Um, I really like this definition from the IPCC report in 2007. They do have an updated uh, definition in their newest report, but um, I just don't like it as much as this one, so I'm going to use this one. Um, they define vulnerability as a function of the sensitivity of a particular resource to climate changes 
its exposure to those changes, and its capacity to adapt <coughs> to those changes. And so you'll see I've bolded those three components of vulnerability that they highlight. Um, and really, exposure and sensitivity give us a sense of the potential impact of climate on a given resource. And then that impact paired with that resource's ability to adapt then gives us a sense of its overall vulnerability to climate change. And so that's kind of how that all um, looks with those three components. And I want to point out that while vulnerability assessments cannot make um, management decisions for us. It's, um, they're a very useful and important tool because they can help us prioritize species and systems for management actions. They can help us develop management strategies to address climate change because not only do we understand um, that, that a particular resource is more vulnerable than others, but we also now know why it's more vulnerable. Um, and uh, this process helps us to efficiently allocate limited resources as well. So to walk through these three um, <clears throat> vulnerability components, I wanted to provide a definition and also give you a sense of what workshop participants were giving um, us regarding their feedback that enabled us to, in the end, produce an actual score for vulnerability. And so that first component is exposure. And this is simply a measure of how much of a change in climate or other environmental factor a resource is likely to experience. Um, for example, rising sea level, as you see in this graph from a tide gauge in San Francisco, or um, reduced pH directly related to the aragonite saturation levels, as you can see in the, um, the next figure. And so this component was really the most straightforward. We basically listed a whole bunch of climate factors because we did want to take everything into consideration. And we asked workshop participants to provide a degree of exposure ranging from one low exposure to five high exposure for a list of, um, for that list of climate factors for whichever focal resource they are, they were working on at the moment. Um, and so in the end, we're able to average all of those um, degrees of exposure across all climate factors to give us an overall um, relative um, value for exposure for each resource. The next component that participants looked at was sensitivity. And so exposure tells us, um, is a resource likely to experience this impact? Sensitivity then kind of gives us the, the next step of, of necessary information of does that experience matter? Um, does that exposure impact the species or habitat in any way um, that will matter? <clears throat> and so sensitivity is a measure of whether and how a resource is likely to be affected by a given change in climate. And so this category of vulnerability had um, a little bit more information that we were asking um, participants to provide. They looked at that same list of climate factors, and instead of um, telling us how exposed they think that species will be to that factor, they were telling us how sensitive they think that species is to that factor. They also gave us a sense of sensitivity to non-climate stressors, such as um, invasive species, uh, impacts from recreation, harvest, roads, coastal armoring. Um, we had a whole list and also asked them to, to propose new ones that maybe we hadn't thought of ahead of time. And they were also giving us information on dependencies. Um, so for species, for example, is, is the sea otter specific on a specific prey item? Um, is it dependent on a specific habitat type? Is it more of a generalist or a specialist? And so all of this information was provided um, on a scale of one to five. So just like exposure, um, at the end, we're able to average all of these scores to give us an overall score for um, sensitivity for every resource. And then the final component of vulnerability is adaptive capacity. And this is the ability to accommodate or cope with climate change impacts with minimal disruption. And some of the things that workshop participants were providing for us um, to give examples for the, the species category, they were looking at um, the extent, status, and dispersal ability of a species, um, again, ranked on a scale of one to five, um, population connectivity, genetic diversity, behavioral and morphological plasticity, and then some socioeconomic uh, factors as well. Um, does the general public value this species? And is there potential for management to, to do anything about um, this species to limit its uh, vulnerability to climate? <clears throat> and so again, we were able to um, average all of these scores to provide an overall um, relative score of adaptive capacity for every resource. And so 
again, to look at how these three components um, relate, we, uh, in the end, have a score for exposure, sensitivity, and adaptive capacity for every resource. Um, and that gets us to an overall score for vulnerability using this uh, very simple equation. Um, and I wanted to provide a couple examples just to put some real numbers in there. And you'll see there's an extra number down there um, next to the exposure score of 0 0.5. And we decided to give um, less weight to the exposure score relative to the sensitivity and adaptive capacity scores simply because the uncertainty of um, about the magnitude and rate of future climate changes. Um, sensitivity and adaptive capacity, a lot of that information is um, readily available in the literature, and so it's much more certain than um, the, the exposure score. So we decided to weight that score a little less than the other two. Um, and so to provide a couple examples, I have a couple intertidal species here, the California mussel and the sea palm, which is an intertidal alga. Um, the mussel, was rated as having moderate to high exposure to climate impacts, um, moderate sensitivity to climate impacts and to non-climate stressors, and moderate adaptive capacity. And so the muscle was identified as having overall a low to moderate vulnerability. Um, the sea palm, on the other hand, had very similar exposure, um, slightly higher sensitivity, and slightly lower adaptive capacity. So overall was rated as having slightly higher uh, vulnerability. And so this was done for every, um, all 44 resources that we, that we had assessed. And to give you a sense, um, this is not all that we did in order to produce our vulnerability assessment report. Um, this is kind of the information flow diagram of how we, how we got to that report. We have um, the three components of vulnerability at the top with the scores that you just saw that we, we calculated for each in addition to narrative accounts from workshop participants, um, any additional information they had to provide us. They also uh, documented um, certainty for all the scores that they provided us, so we have confidence evaluations for all of those. Um, and so basically from the workshop, we were able to get these overall relative vulnerabilities for all of our resources. But we wanted to also pair this with information from the literature, recognizing that you know, we, we're asking a small group of folks over a two-day time period to provide us all of this information um, and recognizing that they may not uh, have all of that information or they, they could be biased or not um, necessarily know um, all the answers to all of those questions. So we spent many months uh, looking through the literature to uh, either support um, those assertions or provide contrasting information. And so basically this is all wrapped up together into the vulnerability assessment report, um, which is currently in peer review right now. Uh, all the individual reports for the resources have, have been reviewed by subject area experts. Um, and now the, the more general components of the report, the introduction, the methodology, conclusion, that's, that's currently in peer review. And once that's completed, um, we hopefully can put it all together um, this is what the cover I expect to look like. We do plan on publishing this um, as part of the ONMS Conservation Science Series. So once we do have it finalized, we will have to go through um, that process to have it published um, as part of that series. Um, but the bulk of the report will consist of, I just wanted to give everyone a sense of kind of what it will look like, will consist of these um, shorter uh, reports for each resource. Um, and this is where you can see kind of how we've, we've laid everything out. We have an executive summary that summarizes everything, um, a general score table that gives the overall component scores of vulnerability and the confidence levels for those. Um, and then we go into each component of vulnerability and break it down into each element that we asked the workshop participants to give us feedback on. And for each of those elements, we have um, the information that the workshop folks gave us, but also where we were able to find it, we have information from the literature to supplement um, that information from the workshop participants. And so this is kind of how each, each individual report will be organized, and there will be 44 of these um, in this, in this uh, larger report. So it's, it's going to be um, a very thick good paperweight of a report, but hopefully very easy to navigate. Um, if you're interested in a particular species or a particular habitat, you can just go to that report. Um, and so we're, we're pretty excited to get this wrapped up. And then 
and the appendices will have um, information regarding the two decision support workshops, a list of reviewers and contributors to the report, and um, a table that will look like this for each resource that shows all the very specific scores provided by the workshop participants for every element of um, the components of vulnerability, along with the confidence scores that they gave. Um, the reports themselves, the summary reports for each resource, uh, provides these, the overall scores, but these tables and the appendices will provide more specifics. So those will be available um, as well. And so um, that's what you can expect once that report is finished, but I wanted to um, go through, uh, highlight some of the results now um, because I think it's very exciting and interesting and uh, this will be important for starting the next phase of our project, the adaptation planning phase. And so kind of the best way to, to really distill this information down and present it in a webinar setting is through these, these figures. Um, there are limitations. I'm just showing you kind of the categorical scores instead of the actual calculated scores. So um, everything's kind of rounded into the nearest category. And so um, subtle differences are going to be lost in these figures. But this will give you a sense of where our different resources fell out on a scale of vulnerability. Um, sensitivity and exposure are averaged on the x-axis and adaptive capacity is on the y. And so um, if a resource has lower adaptive capacity but higher exposure and sensitivity, then it will be more vulnerable to climate impacts and you'll, and you'll see it'll fall out um, towards the lower right of the figure. If it's identified as being less sensitive and exposed but, um, and, and with a higher adaptive capacity, then it will be um, less vulnerable and so you'll see it fall out more towards the upper left corner of the figure. And so to start off a little easy, we'll do habitats first. And um, because it's hard to tell the subtle differences in scores, I did want to label um, kind of the, the most vulnerable resources just so that you could see those. And so these are the eight habitats that were assessed. Um, and what's interesting here is that there's not as much spread in the ability of these habitats to adapt. They all were rated either moderate or moderate high. But there is more variability in the sensitivity and exposure, and that's because the offshore rocky reef habitat was identified as um, having a lower sensitivity and exposure to climate impacts than the other habitats. Um, the most vulnerable habitats identified are those that exist at the land-sea interface, and that's beaches and dunes, estuaries, and the rocky intertidal. And the key climate-driven factors that were identified for these three habitats were sea level rise, wave action, and coastal erosion. Um, flooding and inundation of these habitats was a primary concern listed by uh, workshop participants, as well as disturbance to the integrity of the habitats due to increased storms, wind, and wave events. Key non-climate stressors identified for these three most vulnerable habitats include coastal armoring and invasive species. And then the least vulnerable habitats were offshore rocky reefs and the kelp forest habitat. Um, but these were uh, rated as least vulnerable for very different reasons. You'll see offshore rocky reefs were identified as being less sensitive and exposed, um, whereas the kelp forests have moderate sensitivity and exposure but a greater ability to adapt to those climate changes. So moving on to ecosystem services. Um, and I think it's kind of interesting to go back and forth between the two. Um, ecosystem services rated very high for sensitivity and exposure, but there is much greater diversity in the adaptive capacity of these services. Um, and again, what's interesting is those services that are provided primarily by our coastal habitats seem to have fallen out as being the most vulnerable. Um, float and erosion, flood and erosion protection is provided by our coastal wetlands, estuaries, beaches and dunes. Water quality or water purification um, is again provided by our estuaries and beaches. Um, carbon storage, uh, again, our estuaries habitat. So there is some consistency across our resource categories here of what's being identified as, as most vulnerable to climate change. And this will have important implications for the development of management decisions. Um, and so the most vulnerable ecosystem services, flood and erosion protection, um, and this was due to the high exposure and sensitivity for this ecosystem service due to climate factors that will impact sediment deposition and erosion, such as storm, sea level rise, and precipitation. 
Um, and carbon storage and sequestration was the second most vulnerable, but this was because of its lower adaptive capacity. And when I went back and looked through the scores, it looked like this was primarily due to the lack of support from the general public in protecting the provision of this service. Um, this is probably an underappreciated ecosystem, ecosystem service, if you will, especially compared to things like flood and erosion protection and recreation and tourism and food production. Not surprisingly, the least vulnerable ecosystem service was recreation and tourism, and you can see that's primarily because of its adaptive capacity score. Um, people really greatly value this ecosystem service, and they'll likely be willing to change their behavior in order to retain this service. Also, local economies depend on this service, so it's very important to retain, to retain that particular ecosystem service regionally. Workshop participants also noted that management is probably easiest for recreation and tourism because infrastructure can easily adapt and education of the public can help mitigate non-climate stressors um, to that ecosystem service. <coughs> So now moving on to species, um, and the, there's a lot of information here on this figure, um, and we did actually end up grouping species that had very similar scores just uh, to make the figure less messy and actually be able to put everything on here. And so you'll see some birds and birds and fish were grouped, um, and, and there's little asterisks near those groupings on the actual figure. Um, once again, I numbered the top 10 most vulnerable species, and this represents the top third of um, the species because we had about 31 species assessed. And with the exception of the pteropod and the blue whale, which use our offshore habitat, and the ashy storm petrel, which uses our coastal cliffs and offshore, um, the rest of the top 10 species identified as being most vulnerable are those that use our three most vulnerable habitats, estuaries, beaches and dunes, and the rocky intertidal. So once again, we're seeing consistency across all resource categories um, that those resources that exist at the land-sea interface are really what our workshop participants have identified as being most vulnerable to climate and um, will likely receive um, prioritization and more attention um, during our adaptation planning uh, phase of the project. Um, a few other things to note in this figure, um, just by looking through the results that I thought I would share, uh, bird and mammal species overall ranked as being more vulnerable than fish or invertebrate species. Um, most invertebrates ranked as having moderate exposure and sensitivity and moderate adaptive capacity. And all fish species ranked as having moderate exposure and sensitivity, but varied widely in their um, ability to adapt to those changes. And all of this information is available in the report, um, much more specific than what I'm able to provide here. Another piece of information that um, is not only, I think, interesting, but will be um, useful to our adaptation planning exercise is to look at those climate-driven stressors that um, according to our workshop participants, will be impacting our resources the most. And so what I did is I looked across all resources and averaged the sensitivity scores um, for each climate-driven factor. And so the top five most impactful climate-driven stressors are wave action, coastal erosion, salinity, pH, and dynamic ocean conditions, which refers to kind of a grab bag of currents, mixing, and stratification in the open ocean. Um, this is kind of a different way to look at it and to look across all resources which climate factors were actually referenced the most number of times. They may not have been given the greatest sensitivity scores, but they, um, according to workshop participants, impact the most number of resources. And so that would be pH um, was the number one, and then followed by dyna dynamic ocean conditions, and then sea surface temperature. And then similarly with the non-climate stressors, um, roads and coastal armoring was found to, to have the most impact across all resources, followed by invasive and problematic species, recreation, which is interesting because that's also a resource we're trying to protect, um, pollution and poisons, and land use change. And then again, the most cited, so the most number of resources that listed this non-climate stressor um, is pollution and poisons, harvest, and invasive and problematic species. <clears throat> and so using this information, we can then move on to the adaptation planning phase of our project to determine how we may be able to reduce vulnerability of our resources. 
And we've decided to tackle this through the use of our advisory council. Um, the advisory council of our sanctuary um, is a representative group of folks from the community, and we can convene working groups through this advisory council. And so that's what we've decided to do, is to convene a climate smart adaptation working group um, via our, our Sanctuary Advisory Council. And the goal of this group will be to develop and prioritize management strategies that can be feasibly implemented to reduce the vulnerability of focal resources while considering a range of plausible future climate scenarios for the region. And vulnerability can be reduced in a number of ways, <clears throat> but in general we hope to reduce the exposure or sensitivity of a resource or um, enhance a resource's adaptive capacity. And so that's really what this group will be um, trying to determine is how we can do this for our most vulnerable resources. And so the working group itself um, is, is going to be quite large, but um, considering the, our huge geographic range and how many um, management agencies are involved alone, that that kind of forces us to have um, a larger, more diverse group. Um, and I apologize for the ridiculous overuse of acronyms, but um, that's just the way it is with federal agencies. Um, suffice it to say, we have a lot of participation from federal, state, and local levels, um, as well as non-governmental organizations and representatives of, ac of academia. Um, the group's first meeting will be April 22nd, and at that meeting, they'll likely decide how many additional meetings they think they'll need um, over the course of the year. Our ultimate goal, really, <coughs> is for them to be able to produce these prioritized um, adaptive management recommendations back to the Sanctuary Advisory Council at the Council's November meeting. Um, but we'll see if we can hit that timeline. They may need some additional time. And so to kind of walk through the specific goals um, and objectives of this group, in general, we want them to um, approach adaptation planning through the use of scenarios. And so I wanted to kind of explain um, these climate scenarios and, and why scenario planning is important and how it's done before I really get into the adaptation planning portion. And so scenario planning is a very effective way of dealing with uncertainty and climate change. Um, there are some climate factors we don't even yet know the direction of change, let alone the magnitude of change. And so this is a way of incorporating that uncertainty into the planning process instead of letting it kind of stall um, any progress. <clears throat> Scenario planning is also really effective, though, as a way to identify the most robust management actions um, in an uncertain future. And so basically uh, the group will, will be working within these different um, future scenarios of climate for the region, and they'll be proposing adaptation actions, and those actions that find overlap among multiple different scenarios will be those that um, we know will be more robust and uh, likely more successful in an uncertain future. And so to give an example um, of this, there's a really great guide called Scenario Planning for Climate Change Adaptation. There's, there's multiple guides um, on scenario planning. Um, as it relates to um, adaptation out there, but this is just one of them. And they used a case study um, to explain um, the process from Marin County in which the group, um, uh, th basically what you do is you, you come up with your most impactful and your most uncertain drivers of change, and you cross those to come up with multiple plausible futures. And so what this group decided on, the two climate factors that they felt were most impactful and or most uncertain, um, was the onset of the dry season and the direction of the strong wind. Um, and so re depending on which way that climate factor will go will give you different um, plausible future scenarios for the region. And so what we want our group to do is, is to um, def define those or select those final drivers, the most uncertain and most impactful drivers of change, to serve as a framework and to use those drivers to define distinct climate um, scenarios for the region. And then once they um, have those scenarios defined, they'll work in small groups to further develop that scenario. They'll build out a storyline, they'll evaluate potential implications for our study region for that scenario, and they'll begin brainstorming adaptive management responses for that scenario specifically. <clears throat> 
Um, and then the ultimate goal is to develop, evaluate, and prioritize potential actions for each of those scenarios based on the vulnerability um, assessment results. And so within those small groups, they'll brainstorm potential management responses, they'll eval evaluate how well each action might perform in each scenario, and within each scenario, scenario they'll prioritize those actions. Um, the groups, we plan to have them rotate through each scenario so everyone is able to um, give input for each future climate scenario. And then at the end of this process, everyone will come back together and um, we'll look at all those um, proposed management actions for each scenario, identify any overlapping actions that were identified for multiple scenarios, um, and then work through a prioritization exercise um, in order to make the final recommendations. <coughs> And so I mentioned that those recommendations would go to the Sanctuary Advisory Council first, and they would then decide to forward those on to our Sanctuary Superintendent. Um, that information would then take um, an internal process, of uh, internal just to our Sanctuary, Gulf of the Fairlawns, in order to come up with an implementation plan of those actions that our Superintendent feels are feasible um, and can be implemented on a short, um, mid, or long-term time frame. But we also want those recommendations um, to be made available to all of our partner agencies and any other groups that are looking to do work in the area to address climate change. And so all of those recommendations we will put together in um, a summary report, um, some sort of, of document output that can be made available to um, anyone that's interested to see um, what this group came up with after a very um, long and exhaustive process. We want that information to get out to as many people as possible. So um, basically this information will take two routes, an internal route to the sanctuary and then um, an external route where we will make that information accessible and available to everyone. And so just to, to provide an overview of our proposed project timeline, um, we accomplished those decision support workshops um, in 2014 and have been since uh, diligently writing and putting together these reports for all of our focal resources. And the uh, vulnerability assessment report right now is in review, but we are um, simultaneously putting together our working group and they will be working through the adaptation planning process um, for the remainder of the year, and we hope to have an implementation plan um, for the sanctuary as well as a summary report for um, anyone else interested um, available probably in mid, early to mid uh, 2016. And so I wanted to leave plenty of time for questions, and it looks like we do have plenty of time for that. Um, so thank you for uh, tuning in and, and hearing an update to this project. Um, you can contact me at any time and uh, visit our website for more information on our climate program as well. Um, and so thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, Sarah. I just want to point out a couple of quick things. First of all, if anyone did miss the earlier presentation and would like to get that detail um, on the phase one of this project, it is posted on Open Channels and on the MPA Center website. So we'd be happy to share those with you or you can go find those where they're posted. Um, and second, I just wanted to say that I think a lot of sites have really not got as far as Gulf of the Farallones, and so I think this has been a great overview of all of the complexity and steps that are involved in going through this sort of process, and I think we all um, are, are looking to, to you all at Gulf of the Farallones to see what your experience is, so it's great to be able to share this uh, with this larger group. So I will go ahead and turn to the questions and just encourage those who are on the webinar to please go ahead and type in your questions in the question box, and we'll I'll be happy to, to answer those. So uh, the first question, uh, actually I think he's left, but I will go ahead and, and ask that, <laughs> is did you account for um, score uncertainty in your exposure sensitivity rankings? Yes, we, we do have um, ex um, uncertainty scores. Um, so basically every time, for, for any score that a workshop participant gave us, there was an accompanying confidence evaluation. Um, and so you'll see in those score tables in the appendices, and we also have <coughs> that information available summarized in the reports, um, every bit of information they gave us, they gave us an accompanying evaluation um, confidence score as well. So we do have that information available. Um, and in some instances, the confidence is very low just because 
there's we all have to acknowledge that information just is not available at this time. Um, and so that's very important to keep in mind when we're reading through these results um, to take a look at that confidence evaluation to really understand um, what these workshop participants were thinking at the time. And where we could, we tried to back that up with literature to provide a little more um, confidence to that score, if you will, um, if that information was available in the literature. But um, yes, those, those confidence evaluations are available. Okay. Uh, here's, a, here's a question from Vincent Guida who asks, um, how did you make the decisions on which habitat species and ecosystem services to choose? So that, that right. process where you went through the focal um, right, that's a great question. Um, so we started that internally. Um, we looked through a lot of management documents um, that list, you know, there's, there's lots of different like key species or um, keystone species. Um, and so we, we looked through the literature and through a lot of internal management documents to look for any listings of um, species or habitats that were identified by um, our management agency or others as being very critical. Um, to the region in general. And so we, we started out with kind of this giant master list. It was a huge Excel sheet that I put together that had um, a, whole, a, a whole list of, I'll just, I'll just go with species as an, as an example, a whole list of species and why we included it, which document we found that species listed in. Um, and so at that first workshop in February where we brought a bunch of folks together, we actually did a survey ahead of time to get their input as well. Um, and so they were able to tell us before the workshop uh, which species and habitats and ecosystem services they felt was most, were most important to assess. Um, and so we, we kind of presented a prioritized list based on those results uh, to the workshop group themselves. And that whole day was spent um, just them deciding which resources were most important for us to consider. And so, you know, a lot of things are taken into account. Is it a protected species? Um, is it a species that's very important uh, commercially or recreationally to the area, um, for example? And so there were a lot of different reasons why folks might have um, asked us to consider a particular species, but we basically took all that input from workshop participants um, and assessed as many of those as we could. And we ended up getting 44 assessments completed. I think that was about three quarters of the um, of the actual final recommended resources. So we didn't get them all finished, but um, still a, a huge undertaking to even um, assess those 44. But um, I will say that there is more information regarding um, the particular process we used of selecting those focal resources um, both in that webinar that you mentioned, Lauren, thank you, that was very smart to mention that webinar from August, um, and also on our website we have links to um, workshop support pages that we had hosted by EcoAdapt that has more information and there's a summary report from that workshop that kind of details um, some of the more, more detailed aspects of how we, how we came up with that group. Okay, um, the questions are starting to to come in, so that's great. Um, <laughs> here's one from Hussein Aladina who asks, is your vulnerability assessment spatially explicit and how do you deal with spatial differences and variation across your study area? Right, and so that's, that's something that is important to, um, to make note of for this assessment. This, this was a very general assessment in the sense that we asked folks and we looked in the literature for um, information regarding generally how is, for example, a beach ecosystem impacted by these different climate factors, different non-climate stressors. We didn't look at actual specific beaches in our study region. Um, this, we're looking at this vulnerability assessment report as really the first pass at this um, attempt to characterize vulnerability in our region. And so it is kind of the more general um, level of, of assessment at this point. We do hope that through our working group, if they identify um, uh, particular areas in the region that are representative of those um, habitats or that, that encompass a lot of those vulnerable species, um, that those areas would end up being prioritized for management action and probably for further assessments for us to better understand, um, okay, for example, Rodeo Lagoon, how is it specifically impacted at that site? Um, what non-climate stressors is it actually exposed to, instead of just a general um, lagoon system. And so um, this, this process is, is 
is definitely the first pass kind of more general assessment. And so we hope that, you know, as this process continues forward, we can further refine this information. And, you know, it is a very iterative process. You learn things and you kind of go back and um, refine what you've done um, once you're kind of starting to figure out where you should put more of your focus. Okay. Um, question from Kevin Grant who says that the process that you use for both phases is clearly transferable and can you estimate how much phase one cost and where was the funding uh, from? Oh, that would be really great for me to have on hand the cost estimates for phase one. Um, you know, it's, it is highly variable. You really can do it on a budget. You can do it all internal to your agency as well. Um, uh, what was the other question? The cost, and I'm sorry, Lauren. Oh, and the, the source question? of funding. Oh, the source of funding, right. So we were able to secure funding um, through some partners of ours, and specifically the California Landscape Conservation Cooperative um, has puts out a lot of requests for proposals for this type of work, and I imagine the other um, LCCs across the nation have um, similar proposals for this type of work. Um, but we also were just asking a lot of our agency partners. And so the National Park Service, um, they were able to, through their local um, field sites, were able to pitch in a little bit of money to support the workshops because really the greatest cost was actually hosting the workshops, finding the venue, the food. Um, everyone participated. Um, you know, as part of their jobs or just to volunteer this information for us. And so I would say that the greatest cost is, you know, staff time to put all this together, but if that is something that can be supported by your agency or organization, um, then that's great. And then any additional cost is just um, through the logistics of hosting the workshop. So I'm sorry I don't have uh, really even a general number for you. I wouldn't want to say something that's way off base. Um, but I think it's it's highly variable, and you can definitely adapt the process to whatever resources you have. Okay, great. And I will just add also that we did recently, our last month's speaker was from the Landscape Conservation Cooperative program talking about how they are working on ocean and coastal issues. So again, right. that's archived on Open Channels and the MPA Center website, marineprotectedareas.noaa.gov. Uh, so if anyone wants to go back and take a look at that. Okay. Um, Another question from Jack Sobel, was ocean acidification one of the stressors that mm -hmm. you considered in looking at vulnerability? It was, yeah. Ocean acidification was, and um, if you remember the slide where I presented the climate drivers that were um, found to be most impactful and, and, and most cited across resources, um, reduced pH or ocean acidification was um, one of the most uh, or it was the most cited climate driver across all resources, and it was one of the more impactful climate drivers as well. So we know that will, um, that's a very important climate driver. It's, it's very, very difficult to manage, um, but it is one that has risen to the top in our process. Okay. And um, Roger Griffiths is asking, I'm sorry I missed this, but can you remind me how you defined vulnerability? Was it assessing vulnerability to changes in abundance or distribution or related to exposure? Um, so that's kind of a, it's kind of a complicated question. There are, um, and I, I, would, I would ask that Roger um, look back and watch the recorded version of this as well as the, the previous webinar as well. Um, but vulnerability has a lot of components to it, and it is kind of a, a complicated term in and of itself, but we broke it down um, into the three components that are most often um, used by folks looking at vulnerability, and that's exposure, sensitivity, and adaptive capacity. And then each of those components in and of itself has uh, many different elements to it. Um, and so there is a lot of information that's kind of wrapped up in this term vulnerability, and so pretty much everything that Roger listed was um, included in that. Okay. Then actually it's interesting, there are two questions here related to um, lumping versus splitting, I would say. So um, mm -hmm. Robert Brock asks, instead of focusing on individual species, might it be easier and less costly for most areas to initially focus on large guilds, such as those found at the land-sea interface? And then Roger asked, um, you know, that because vulnerability assessments are relative assessments among the species chosen, um, does combining very different groups, in, in other words, coastal versus marine, um, is, that, is that the most appropriate way to do it, or should it have been done separately for marine and coastal species to better understand what their distinct oh, vulnerabilities are? 
Okay, so the first question was um, about being able to assess uh, multiple species at once. Um, if they're kind of in the same habitat or ex, you know exposed to the same conditions, and I would say definitely yes, that can be done. Um, I was participating in the Rocky Intertidal group uh, during the vulnerability assessments, and we found that for a lot of the species in the Rocky Intertidal system, the especially for exposure, we are pretty much saying the same thing. Um, they are exposed to many of the same um, climate and non-climate stressors. Um, you know. Where there's a lot of differences, though, is, it is, is in the adaptive capacity component. So as we were going along, um, workshop participants kind of took it upon themselves to, um, there were a few instances, the, the Cliffs Habitat group did a great job of this. They had five bird species that they were tasked with assessing. And as they started those assessments, they realized as they were going along that, wait a minute, these three species they really um, are very similar. They use the same habitats. They, they act in the same way. Um, and so they ended up lumping their five species into two groups. One was cavity nesters and one was surface nesters. Um, and they provide a justification for that. Um, there were a few differences in adaptive capacity um, that they were able to tease out. And so you'll see um, the reports for those two categories most of the information is, is the same for those species, but where it differs, um, we were able to acknowledge that. And so, yes, that can save time and money, um, I think, by assessing species um, together in groups. If, um, but I, I would be careful. I would, I would caution doing that from the outset. This had really happened organically. As a group started assessing them, they realized um, that they could be assessed simultaneously. And so I'm not sure that you would know that until you necessarily get started. Um, and then Roger's question about us, I think what he meant is, is that we were assessing coast and ocean species together and that um, it may not be appropriate um, rel kind of comparing them um, that's right. across, across that landscape. Um, and, you know, that's, that's, a, that's a good question. And I hadn't really considered if maybe that would be inappropriate to compare, um, you know, offshore species with um, dune or, coast, or coastal cliff species. Um, and so I, you know, had not really considered that, um, but to be honest, it, it really served a purpose for our, um, our management purposes, and that is we manage um, from the coast out to the open ocean. And so if we're managing for all of these resources, we kind of need to know um, how we can prioritize among all of those resources. So I think for us and for many of our partner agencies, it serves a purpose, um, and so we, we now know that it was those coastal habitats that are uh, more vulnerable than, say, the offshore habitat, and if we had assessed them separately, kind of two different processes, we may not have been able to make that comparison. So I would say it really depends on, on the process and the region and also your, your management goals of um, what's appropriate. Okay, great. Um, here's an interesting question uh, asking, did you talk at all about coastal community vulnerability in terms of a socioeconomic component? Right. Um, we did not include that in this assessment. That That is um, a whole other uh, huge, huge effort. Um, and we as a, as a management agency for natural resources, we didn't um, feel that that would be an appropriate part of this assessment. Um, but we are partnering with some local um, management agencies that, that are doing these sorts of things. Marin County has their C-SMART um, vulnerability assessment for sea level rise, and they're looking at um, the impact to human infrastructure and communities in Marin County. And so we are partnering with them to provide them with some of the more biological information um, and they can then uh, provide us with um, some more of the socioeconomic information. So it just wasn't um, something that we were able to incorporate in our process. Um, I think it would be a huge undertaking to try to do socioeconomics and um, all of your ecological assets at the same time. Um, and I'm not, I don't know of anyone that is doing that sort of assessment, but I would be curious to hear if um, there is. My understanding is that the National Estuary and Research Reserves are doing some work on that, and they maybe are. that's okay. something that we could uh, try to present in the future. I think I that would be that. fantastic, yeah. And, and related to uh, other ongoing work, Roger asked that we mention that NIMFS has developed a similar but different methodology for assessing climate vulnerability of marine and coastal fish stocks. 
right. and they have used that to assess about 80 fish stocks and species and we'll have that available by summer. So again, I think that would be great to uh, you know, have someone come and present that work. It sounds like there's a lot going on that, that would be good to, um, to share. Yeah, and there's many different ways to approach this. Um, we did take kind of the high level, more general approach um, that those NIMS assessments are based on very specific, from what I understand, very specific modeling um, and is much more quantitative in a sense. Um, and so they're very different um, approaches to looking at vulnerability. So I think it would be really interesting to, to take a look at the way other folks are doing this. Okay. Um, and uh, just also on that subject, uh, Roger notes that NIMS and partners are also doing vulnerability assessments of fishing dependent communities in Alaska and along oh, the Gulf of Maine. So again, uh, some interesting social science work going on. Yeah. Uh, so the next couple of questions are getting more into the nitty gritty. We've been up very high and I'll go down into detail. <laughs> um, Jack Sobel asked, did the surface micro layer come up anywhere in your analysis as a critical and vulnerable habitat? Um, no, it didn't. Um, is, I guess he's, is he referring to the surface micro layer of the ocean? The top, I believe so, yeah. The top, however, um, um, depth of the ocean? No, it, it didn't. We did not um, assess that. I guess that, that would have maybe come out as a, as a separate habitat, um, but no, that did not come out during our process. Okay, and then Paula Kohlberg has uh, noted that there is a new paper in Nature Climate Change called Vulnerability and Adaptation of U.S. Shell Fisheries to Ocean Acidification that might oh, okay. be helpful to your process. Wonderful, yeah, okay. Thank you for that. And then um, another question, why did you decide to weight the exposure score and how much did you weight it by? Right, so we decided to weight the exposure score because um, we felt that the uncertainty associated with future climate impacts was much greater than any uncertainty um, for the other components of vulnerability. Um, specifically, when you're looking at how sensitive a species is or its ability to adapt um, based on its population status or extent, this is all information that's available in the literature um, and is, is much more readily known. The exposure to future climate impacts is so um, uncertain at this point. Some of these climate impacts, we don't even really know the, the direction of change, let alone the magnitude. And so we just felt that it um, would provide more robust results if we weighted exposure less than sensitivity and adaptive capacity. And it was weighted at half, so we multiplied that factor by 0.5. Okay, I'm going to make one more call for questions. It looks like um, we had a lot of really interesting questions, and I just want to note that, that Roger wanted to say thank you, as did several others who wrote in uh, for doing such great work. This is really um, something that a lot of different programs need to do, and it's, uh, it's great to have you out there working through these questions and, and helping illustrate the the challenges and the and the discussion that has to happen in order to um, do this kind of work. Wonderful, so, thank you. Yeah, so it looks like those are all the questions. So again, I'd just like to thank Sarah very much and thank EBM Tools and Open Channels. And you can uh, look for this to be posted in the next day or so up on the MPA Center website and on Open Channels. So again, thanks. Thank you very much.